Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie? Welcome back to Remember That Movie. I am the third Alejandro Rosa on IMDb. And I'm Steve Johnston, and I'm not on IMDb. As we said in our previous episode, we were going to go forward in time from 1965 to 1995 for the film Waterworld. I found that I enjoy it when we do more recent movies, because rather than having to look up and see, oh, what was the world like when this came out? We were there. I remember when this movie came out. Steve, how old were you when you saw this film? That I do not remember. I was 15 when the movie came out, but I did not see it in theaters. I remember watching it at home, in the comfort of a couch, watching it on a small screen, and asking myself, all right, let's see if this was as bad as everyone said it was. Now, where does this fall in the Costner verse? Because I remember, much like Nicolas Cage when we talked about City of Angels, how he had a slew of hits, and then City of Angels kind of started a downturn where there were expectations that were not met. I have a recollection of the same thing happening with Costner. I remember he was big, and the biggest thing that he had done somewhat prior to this was Dances with Wolves. I did not see Dances with Wolves, but I remember it because at the Oscars that year, it was nominated for what seemed like every category. So let's talk about this for a second, because what happened was I went down a rabbit hole because I had the same question. I said, where does this fall in mm -hmm. the Kevin Costner timeline of success? Yes. And so I went deep into the world of, uh, of film history and found that Kevin Costner wildness starts in 1987 when he is in The Untouchables. This is the movie that sort of put him on the map. Now, we, we've talked about The Big Chill and things like that, but this movie, this is his movie. This is his big breakout role. Right after it, the very next year, Bull Durham comes out. Another mm. huge success. Now we're in 1988, and we're going to go fast. 1989, Field of Dreams. 1990, Dances with Wolves. Not only does he star in Dances with Wolves, he directs it. And it is his first feature film. The film goes on to get 12 Oscar nominations and wins seven of those Oscars, including Best Director and Best Picture. And the film goes on to make, you know, something like $400 million. Right. With a $22 million budget. That's 1990. And then you say, okay, well, that's pretty great. Kevin, did you take a break? No, 1991. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, a film that critics didn't love it. People certainly did. I grew up in Puerto Rico, so films sometimes were delayed in coming to Puerto Rico. This was one of those movies that we were very excited about. And when my friend Joseph went to the United States to visit family, he cut out advertisements from films from the newspaper and mailed them to me. And this was one of them. And I was so excited. <laughs> I remember this vividly. This is another one, you know, costs like $48 million to make. $390 million. This man can do no wrong. It was the second highest grossing film of 1991. The only reason it wasn't first, Terminator 2 was first. Mm -hmm. Okay, still in 1991, end of 1991, he is in JFK, which ends up being nominated for Best Picture. And then 1992, The Bodyguard. Kevin Costner. Whitney Houston. Oh, yes. Makes, again, $400 million on a $25 million budget. This man can do no wrong. This man makes gold happen. And then, like all good things, a couple of missteps happen. Ends up in two films that don't do as well, and then Waterworld. Now, he doesn't direct it, but he stars in it. And he's the producer, which I think is also very, very important, which means he has a lot of say. And again, we're at peak Costnerism. He's the studio's golden child. They listen to him. They'll do whatever he wants. So when he says, I want to do a freaking action movie on water, they say, sure, how much? And he says, can I have, uh, you know, maybe like $100 million? And they say, sure. <laughs> so this is the film. This is Waterworld starring Kevin Costner. It has, of course, a few other people that we will get into. But this was supposed to be super epic. And that's what I went to the movie theater to see. Now, why didn't you go to the movie theater to see this? So we have big star, we've got big budget, 
And we have what seems like a very interesting premise. But here's the thing. I was in high school at the time. The first showing is always at midnight on like Thursday night. We couldn't go to opening night because we had school the next day. And so we had all the hype going, but then we got to read the reviews and the reviews said, no, this isn't very good. And I'm, I'm putting that lightly. So I never bothered to see it in the theater because it was not going to live up to the expectations that we had. The press had a lot to do with this film intentionally, unintentionally. The budget definitely did not help the buildup for the film because then it was like, what are you doing? What are you doing with all this money? So it's like, if you're going to spend that much, you'd better blow our minds. <laughs> and then also there were other things like Kevin Costner was very involved from the producing standpoint and he didn't want things to come out about the movie. There was already some press about the budget. And so he banned the press from coming onto the set entirely. Sometimes if you exclude people, they get a little salty and maybe they lean in <laughs> harder, right? Because now you're saying you're not allowed on my set. And they're like, fine. I'm just going to write about your budget. <laughs> and there was a lot of, you know, a lot of rumors and a lot of just bad articles about it. It's hard to talk about this movie without talking about the making of this movie. So we'll, we'll try to kind of combine all these things in, in some sort of rational way. Let's just talk about who made this film. This film uh, was directed by Kevin Reynolds. Kevin Reynolds also directed Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Mm, okay. This was when... This film started, it was written by Peter Rader. He created a story. He wrote the original script in 1986, like a spec script. Okay. He was writing kind of a B movie. In his mind, it was a Harrison Ford kind of vehicle. Was considered Mad Max inspired. I have here in my notes, this is just Mad Max on water, isn't it? And that was a lot of people's criticism of it, actually. But he did say, like, yeah, I was inspired by Mad Max. Yeah. They believe he was also inspired by a comic book series called Freak Wave, which definitely must have had influence, which was also called Mad Max Surfing. <laughs> <laughs> Weird kind of coincidence. The co-creator, Brendan McCarthy, would eventually be one of the three writers on Mad Max Fury Road in 2015. Ah, very good. They hired Dean Semler to be the cinematographer. He actually did Mad Max too. He did Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, the Young Guns movies, and he also did Dances with Wolves. So Kevin's bringing in all the people that he knows, all the okay. quality people. Also, just for anybody who's paying attention to our podcast, he also did 1993's Three Musketeers. That is his work as well. This is our team, our creators, and they decide they're going to film this on water, like not in a tank, in the ocean. Yes. So what do they do? They create an artificial seawater enclosure off the coast of Hawaii. A floating atoll was built, which is like a village with a lagoon in the middle of it. The character that Kevin Costner plays has a boat. They have to make two of them. Each of them costs half a million dollars. Yes, the trimaran. The atoll costs millions as well. And then the bad guys have a ship... They built a recreation of the Exxon Valdez. As you can imagine, filming on water is really difficult. Steve, when you film on water, things move away from you. For example, <laughs> if you're on a boat with a camera and you're filming someone on a boat, then yeah. suddenly your boat moves and then you kind of float away from it. And then you have to do it again. They had things like tsunami warnings, hurricane warnings. They'd have to stop productions. They were makeup artists on the boats. And then they would be doing stuff, and then they'd have to bring them on the boats, and then they'd fix your hair, and they'd fix whatever, and then they'd have to go away on the boat. But in the meantime, it would, the wind was blowing, and then they'd mess you up again, so they'd have to come back. Cast and crew were seasick. Stunt performers got stung by jellyfish. Kevin Costner ended up strapped to his boat during a shot where a storm hit. And at the same time, there was also a helicopter who was trying to film him. Jeez. Oh, he had multiple stunt doubles. One of them, Norman Howell, suffered a near-fatal embolism during a deep-sea dive sequence. They had to helicopter him to a hospital. Our child actor got the nickname, given to her by Kevin Costner, Jellyfish Candy. Because she kept getting stung by jellyfish. She was stung seven times. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh. What I'm saying is, everything's fine. It's going great. Do you know who thought that doing this film not in a tank was a bad idea. Steven Spielberg. 
Steven Spielberg told Kevin Costner, don't do it in open water. Don't. It's a nightmare. I experienced this when I made Jaws, and it was a bad, bad scene. Don't do what I did. Film it in a tank. Unfortunately, Kevin did not listen. This is more of an emotional roller coaster than the movie itself, because <laughs> as you were describing everything that went wrong and the horrors that befell the cast and crew, I started feeling sorry for everyone and feeling like, oh, wow, it's, it's a pity because the end product's not particularly good, but you really put your heart and soul into it. And then you break it to me that, well, he was told not to by Steven Spielberg, and he didn't <laughs> listen. Okay, well, you deserve everything you got then. I mean, oh, jeez. <laughs> exactly. We'll go into a little bit more of the production difficulties, but let's first talk about the actual film a little, you know, before we keep talking about the, the rest of it. So I'm going to try to do a brief summary of Waterworld of the most expensive film ever made, if it was 1991 again. At the beginning of this film, there is a voiceover explaining what happened before the film starts. And the narrator is Hal Douglas, a very, very famous voiceover artist who did the voice for trailers all through the 90s and probably before that. I'm going to try to do my best to read this in a voiceovery way. I will not imitate Hal Douglas, because I can't. Here is my summary of Waterworld. I'm going to get very close to the microphone. <laughs> the polar ice caps have melted. The humans of this time live on water. No one has ever seen dry land, although people believe it exists somewhere. We meet the mariner, a solo drifter who comes to an atoll village to do some trading, but ends up incarcerated, sentenced to death, and then saved at the last minute by a woman named Helen and a girl named Enola. They seek the dry land, and Enola carries a tattoo on her back that appears to be a map to this mystical place. Unfortunately, a group of pirates called Smokers, led by the Deacon, are trying to find Enola for the map. In the end, the Mariner, Helen, and Enola, with the help of others, find dry land. However, this is not the Mariner's world. He returns to the waters and moves on. That's it in a nutshell. And now you don't have to watch it. <laughs> that is Waterworld. Real quick rundown. The cast. The Mariner. He doesn't have a name. Played by, of course, Kevin Costner. Helen. Played by Jean Triplehorn. Where do I know her from? Jean Triplehorn has been in a lot of things. She's been in movies for many years. What I would say, and no offense to Jean Triplehorn, I'm sure you've done a lot of things, but when I think of Jean Triplehorn and her most famous accomplishment, she was the first wife in Big Love. But she's also been in films. Uh, she was in, was it The Firm or The Client? Ooh, I think it was The Firm. Anyway, sorry, Jean Triplehorn. Enola is played by Tina Margarino, who has been in a lot of things as well. They initially wanted Anna Paquin to play the little girl. Anna Paquin, who at this point had already won an Oscar, but she was actually taking a break from acting. So, Tina Margarino was, was it. Eventually, both of these actresses ended up working together on True Blood. And then we have the Deacon, our evil bad guy head of the smokers, who literally smoke. Played by Dennis Hopper. He did this right after Speed. And then we kind of have a, a mix of character actors... Actors that you've seen in a hundred different films. Michael Jeter, Tony and Emmy Award winning actor. I remember him, of course, from The Fisher King, Patch Adams. And some children remember him as Mr. Noodle from 2000 to 2003. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was Mr. Noodle's brother, Mr. Noodle, during that nice. time period. Steve. Yes. What Emmy and Grammy Award winner has a tiny, tiny, tiny role in this film? Emmy and Grammy? Emmy and Grammy, that's right. Hmm. I'm afraid I did not notice. I noticed only because I read up on the movie. I think I would have missed it if I hadn't. Mr. Thomas Jacob Black, a.k.a. Jack Black. Oh, yes. He's the pilot. That's I, right. It, I did not uh, equate him with Grammys for some reason. But now that you've said it out loud, I'm kicking myself. <laughs> this, is, this is when he was doing very small parts in films. Right now, at this moment... His film is number one at the box office, Kung Fu Panda 4. It's currently at the top. 
Again, lots of different actors that you may know from different places. Jack Keller, uh, who's very famous for playing uh, Marty, the landlord in The Big Lebowski. Gerald Murphy. <laughs> Nord, who has the blonde hair. Yes. He looks like a WWF wrestler from the 90s who had probably just finished filming Conan the Barbarian sometime before. Or and Mad was now Max. in this. Yeah. And then you read up on him and you're like, oh, no, you worked with the Royal Shakespeare Company for years. He's a North Irish actor. Oh, that is fantastic. Very famous for being the narrator in the 1981 BBC radio production of The Lord of the Rings. Ooh. Sab Shimono, the elder, very famous character actor in Hollywood during that time period. Just uh, all kinds of people. Kim Coates, who played the drifter, the really creepy drifter. Folks would know him recently from Sons of Anarchy. And I have to point this actor out, and then I'll, I'll be done going through the cast list. Okay. Depp Gage. William Preston. How did you know William Preston? Because I know William Preston, and I know that he plays Depp Gage guy. That's incredible. Yes. If you haven't seen this movie, we're talking about an old man who they have down in the boat where the oil is, whose job is to measure how much they have. It's kind of ridiculous. Do you know he, he only started getting into um, acting when he was 47? This is one of the reasons that I know of him, because he kind of gives me hope, given that he started so late in life, so to speak, on a, a different career path. So yeah, depth gauge guy is my favorite character of this entire movie. You know, for somebody who started when he was 47, just started acting, he ended up with 16 film titles. Yes. That's just cool. And yes, there were a lot of very small parts. He was also in The Fisher King. One day, we might do The Fisher King if I feel like re-traumatizing myself. We have our very, very expensive film. We have a cast. We have a plot. Well, about that. So Peter Rader wrote seven different drafts. When we did Gladiator, we talked about this. Well, they were kind of writing as they went. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of that. Eventually, he was actually replaced by David Tw Twohy. I apologize if I'm saying that last name wrong. They're both billed as the writers for the film. That wasn't the only uh, staffing problem that they had. Alan Curtis, the first assistant director, who said, and I quote, 96 days is not enough for what we're trying to film. He was fired. The set designer was fired. The effects supervisor was fired. And then Costner and Reynolds, the director, they had a terrible time working on Robin Hood. Prince of Thieves. So it was very surprising that they would do this again. There were two conflicting things that I read. One said that Kevin asked for Reynolds to be the director, but then this other thing says that the producers wanted it, probably because of the job that they did on Prince of Thieves, which would make total sense. They clashed repeatedly during the production of this film. Coster did not like the initial cut when he saw it. He ended up taking over the editing room. At that point, the director, Reynolds, quit, said, forget it. And he left. Later, in a wonderful article in Entertainment Weekly, he said, in the future, Costner should only appear in pictures he directs himself. That way, he can always be working with his favorite actor and director. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's glorious. Now, there is a happy ending. Okay. Not about this movie. No. <laughs> they, about their friendship. Okay. All they right. eventually buried the hatchet in 2012. They worked on a miniseries called Hatfields and McCoys that Kevin Reynolds directed. And Costner starred in. So there you go. Very. Mark Isham, the composer. We've talked about this in other episodes. Sometimes when they don't like how a movie's doing, they say, get a new composer. Maybe we can fix it with music. Mark Isham did the music for Nell, did the music for Point Break, did the music for The Black Dahlia. He was working on the score. He wasn't done. Kevin Costner decided that he didn't like it. It was, quote, too ethnic and bleak. Mark Isham offered to try again to, like, redo it. I can, I can do better kind of deal. And uh, they said, no. And they got James uh, Newton Howard, which is a super award-winning composer. And actually did the original 1983 Dune. Did any of the original composer's music stay in the film, or was it all replaced? Unlike Legend, I think it was replaced. Okay. So that's a summary of the production of this, except for one thing. Oops, they went over budget. So originally, $100 million, 96 days of shooting. That doesn't seem like enough for what they're doing. Well, that's what the first uh, assistant director said who got fired. That's why I said it just now. <laughs>
So instead of 96 days, it took them 166 days. And instead of $100 million, it cost them somewhere between $172 and $175 million. Oh. What happened when you eventually did see it as a teenager, and what happened now? When I saw it as a teenager, I don't remember a whole lot, but I remember my overall thought was, oh, this wasn't as bad as everyone made it out to be. It wasn't great, but it wasn't horrible. Oh, how young and foolish I was. Unlike you, I went to the movie theater, and I went into it with full enthusiasm. I wanted the full Kevin. Let's do this. Let's do Prince of Thieves with gills. And I watched it, and I walked out, and I was like, I don't think I like that. <laughs> like I, I, I don't think I got it. I don't think I understood. I, don't, I definitely didn't like it. I didn't like it when I saw it last night. That was the very first time since I walked into a movie theater and walked out going, eh, that wasn't what I wanted. But I had very little memory of a lot of it, I think. I remembered the hair. I remembered the boat. I remember there was a kid and there were bad guys. And Dennis Hopper. I remember Dennis Hopper was in there somewhere. That's it. When you first told me that this is what we were watching, I stopped and I said, okay, what are the first things I remember? Don't think about it, just what pops immediately to mind. Yes. And there are two scenes that popped immediately to mind as the most memorable, the ones that stuck with me. First was the tour through the underwater city, where the Mariner takes Helen and shows her what has become of the old society. Spoiler alert, it's underwater. Second is my favorite scene of the entire film, which is the unfortunate death of Depth Gauge Guy when a lit signal flare is dropped into the pool of oil in which he's floating, it ignites, and as a ball of flame rushes towards him, he utters the line, oh, thank God, and then is immolated. So those are the first two things that popped into my mind. And then as I thought about it, I remembered, you know, other things, the boat, the trimaran, which I have actually seen the trimaran. Following production, it was docked in San Diego for a time. I don't remember who bought it or who owned it. It was either during one of our road trips in high school or a family vacation. We actually saw the boat. There is something impressive about it when you see it in real life and go, oh, that was the thing that was on the screen and did all this stuff, and here it is in front of me. That's cool. What'd you think this time? What did adult Steve think? To try and wrap it in as small a nutshell as I possibly can, every scene in this movie is really good, beautiful to look at, the action shots are phenomenal. The attack on the atoll by the smokers is fantastic because you have essentially a castle siege, but on water. And so there are boats whose job it is to just turn into ramps so that other jet skis can launch over the castle walls. It was phenomenal to watch. Just to take a moment. So the smokers are our bad guys. They like oil, I guess. And they like to smoke cigarettes. I guess. And they have boats that are powered by gasoline as opposed to a lot of other people who are using like sailboats and such. Yes. Their main thing is jet skis. They use a lot of jet skis. And so when you hear the smokers are coming, you see just a, a band of jet skis coming at you and then small boats. And they use guns. That's the other thing. They have a lot of guns. Yes. I, when I was watching this, I'm like, wait, they love gasoline. They love cigarettes. They love guns and jet skis. Are these just the Americans? <laughs> In this scene, it's so funny because, yes, they bring up these ramps. And then first you see the jet skis and you're like, okay, that's cool, I guess. But then you see the water skiers. Being towed by the plane. <laughs> do you remember those shows with the water skiers where yes. they would do these big ramp jumps and things like that? Mm -hmm. It's essentially that, but bad guys. And so... <laughs> They have these like four or five water skiers who are being pulled by the plane and then they jump off the ramp. And four of them make it over the wall and the fifth one very satisfyingly slams into the side of it. It's great. Did you feel like the smokers were in a different movie? The reason I say that is we have our survivors, right? The people who are living on water. It's pretty desolate, post-apocalyptic. Everyone's typically pretty sad. And then you have the smokers whose whole thing is just, it's goofy, it's over the top, 
it's weird, funny, and ju- the tone of the smokers versus the tone of everyone else, very different. Every scene is a fun watch, taken on its own. The problem is that none of the scenes tie together correctly. As soon as you start trying to piece them together to make the overarching plot of the movie, the whole thing falls apart and it just becomes incomprehensible. You have to go into this movie saying, okay, I am going to ignore several scientific inaccuracies. The first one being the very opening shot, which I love. I love that we have the Universal logo, which for those who might not remember, it's the globe and the word Universal in big block letters on top of it. And then the word Universal fades away and we're left with the globe and we start panning around the globe as the narrator is describing what has happened, the ice caps start disappearing and the water level starts rising and the shorelines start changing, and then everything is water. There's not enough ice on the planet to do that. But again, ignore the scientific inaccuracies. Just want to point out that our script writer, Peter Rader, he knew that. He knew that that was not scientifically okay. accurate. And he was like, uh, I'm going to write it anyway. <laughs> And I'm kind of willing to give that to them. Yeah, absolutely. Because like, okay, no, this, this is the premise of the movie that somehow the entire world has flooded, except for what I assume are the peaks of the Himalayas being our only two, you know, the only land masses still peaking up above the water. If I'm remembering correctly, I think at some point in one of their kind of alternate versions of the end, they found like the plaque that said it was Everest. Oh, that would have been cool. Yeah, then they decided, no, we don't want to do that. Oh, uh, that they, they should have kept that in. I have a question for you. One of the things that I could not quite figure out is how much time has passed between the ice, ca- the ice melting and flooding the world and the events of the story. Because we're given a whole bunch of clues and none of them quite gel in my mind. First, we discover through, I think, a a conversation between the Mariner and Helen that, oh, everyone has forgotten that we used to live in cities on dry land and there used to be more of it, indicating that a significant amount of time has passed. The Mariner has mutated and now has working gills so he can breathe underwater. Some significant amount of time had to have passed. Yes. But then we've got the Exxon Valdez, which is still afloat, in horrible shape, but still afloat. And we've got jet skis that are still in semi-working order, and an airplane that is in semi-working order. And despite the fact that we have been told that, oh yes, humanity has forgotten where they came from, the deacon, in his sermon, says, If there's a river, we'll damn it. If there are trees, we'll cut them down. So obviously he has not forgotten where humanity came from and what it was capable of. Are you saying that there's some sort of inaccuracy going on here? When it comes to the plot, yes. Enola, how old is Enola? Good question. I don't think they state it. I would say somewhere between 10 and 13. Okay, see, I, I had her at about 12. That's between 10 and 13, Steve. I know, that's, I'm, I'm agreeing <laughs> with you. Based on what we've heard, I'm led to believe that Enola at one point lived on the island. Yes. And then was removed from the island somehow. I think Helen says we found her floating in a basket. Like Moses. How old was she when she left the island? And I ask that for multiple reasons, because she's found floating in a basket, hinting Moses-like, except she had to have been older than that, because A, she's got the map tattooed on her back, and B, she remembers trees and horses because she is drawing them in all of the little sketches that she does on the boat. So obviously she had to have been older when she left the island, and now she's 12, so how much time has passed for Enola? And then let's talk about the Mariner and Helen and Enola. I am on board with the whole, hey, if I free you from the certain death that you are facing, you're going to take us with you on your boat, and him going, yeah. Sounds good. At that point, the Mariner is in a cage, about to be, quote, recycled, dead, and she comes to save him with that condition. That is actually one of my favorite lines. He's like sinking in this muddy goop, and she says, if I free you, you're going to take us with you. And he just says, fine. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that was actually a great line. (laughs) I was with them 
to the extent that, ah, this is the, the unlikely group that has been forced together to do a thing. And so they're going to go on this journey together and they'll define that they actually can work together nicely, which is what happens. My issue is that they manage to escape the atoll, they get away from the smokers, and then they start sailing off. And Helen says to the mariner, you're taking us to dry land, right? And the mariner says, yeah, but one of you has to go because we don't have enough supplies to get all three of us there. So either you or the girl is going to have to go overboard. That ends up not happening, obviously. But he's promised to take them to dry land, or at least that is the guise that he is putting up. We find out later that he considers dry land to be a myth and that it does not exist. Mm -hmm. What was his plan? Where was he taking them? And why did he put up with them for as long as he did, for the 12 days travel time that he had with them? Because all they do, at least during the initial part of the voyage, is piss him off. Whether it's Enola drawing on the boat, or during a smoker attack, Helen darn near breaks most of the trimaran. And he's doing this why? Because he's not taking them where they want to go. In other movies, in better movies, this sort of deception exists, except we as the audience are clued in as to what the guy is thinking. We have an inner monologue, we have a, a note written down that would say something like, oh yeah, and I'm going to take these guys over to this trading outpost and ditch them there, or something like that. We never get that. It's just that you are a thorn in my side, I don't like having you around, but I'm going to keep you around, and I'm going to lie to you about where we're going and, and what's happening. This movie broke my mind because the more I started thinking about how everything was supposed to tie together, the more it does not tie together. A hundred percent. Do you want to know what my biggest beef with this movie is? I would love to. The Mariner. He's a horrible person. He throws the kid in the water, and it's not a joke. He throws her in the water like, ah, screw it. When Helen is desperately trying to save this child, who is not her child, by the way? Let's just point that out, because Helen is the freaking rock star in this movie. Helen is trying to protect this child that is not hers. And she goes, well, is there anything else? Is there something I can give you? You know, and then kind of propositions him. Is it, you know, can I provide this for you? And we and are treated to full backle nudity. Which is not her, by the way. That is not Jean Triplehorn. But they did allow her to pick the actress whose bottom would be representing her. Anyway, she takes off her clothes, and he's sort of, hey, maybe, maybe, and then, no, 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 no. And later we find out in one of the more, in quotes, romantic scenes, where he said, because you didn't really want me. It's like, well, why would she not want you, murderous person who hates them and wants them to die and was ready to kill the child five minutes into your journey? And that's not even the best part. How about the time where they mess up his boat so he chops off their hair? This was one of the scenes that actually made me laugh. Not the initial cutting of the hair. So this actually comes following the loss of the, 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 the harpoon cannon. Yes. The mariner is pissed off, and understandably so, and as punishment, he takes a knife and just hacks away at Helen's hair. A traumatic scene that makes you think this is an abusive human creature. Well, he on. is, yes. But no, the next bit is played for laughs because Enola pipes up and says, Hey, she said she was sorry. You're supposed to say something back. Snap cut to Helen sitting next to Enola. And now Enola also has, <laughs> has her, had her hair chopped off. And they're both just looking mournfully off into the distance. It's it's wrong because as you say it is like traumatic it and is abusive, abusive and all and that. It is abusive and traumatic. But that cut was that cut was funny. I'm sorry. I <laughs> know the cut is funny. It's just the first part of it. I was like, "Whoa, this is so not cool. What is this?" Cuz she's screaming cuz it looks like he's about to kill her with a knife. And instead he redirects his anger, let's say, and chops off her hair in a violent violent way. And then when you think, "Okay, I guess things are going better now. Then they meet another drifter. He has paper. A very interesting commodity. He has actual paper. And so first he has to buy the women. And then he says, well, can I, you know, can I just have them for a little bit kind of deal? What does the mariner say, Steve? He says you can have half an hour with Ellen. Yep. But on, but on my boat. <laughs> on my boat. Right, because he's, he's, a, he's a gentleman. And yes, he asked for the kid first. And they said, no. He said, you can have her for half an hour without batting an eye. 
The mariner is not a nice person. The mariner is not a kind person. He's the worst. And so he sends her down into, you know, the hull with creepy guy. And then we have Enola looking at him like, seriously? And then he's like, oh, maybe this is a bad idea. And then he goes down there and goes, I changed my mind. You know, and then he and the guy fight and one of them dies. Oh, vindication. We have a change of heart. This is the change of heart in the character that we care about. He's a little better than we thought. He's not going to let this man just violate her for half an hour. That's nice. And then when Enola doesn't know how to swim, eventually we have a scene where Helen wakes up and he's teaching her. And we truly have a scene of her clearly falling for him because he's stopped being violent for about five minutes. And you're like, oh, really? We're going to go with a love story here. This is the love story. Look, he's being nice to a child. Isn't that great? I'm like, no, this is an abusive relationship. Girl, you can do better than this. I don't like this character. And you can say, well, he grows and then he goes and he saves Enola. Okay, but I don't buy it. Again, with the inconsistencies of character, there's no growth here. The growth is he decided not to let a woman get raped. And then he didn't also kill a kid. That's the growth. And this goes back to your point, Steve. These things do not add up. Nope. As a script. Sorry, script writers. Also, Kevin wrote some of this too. And at some point, Joss Whedon was flown in when he was much younger. And he spent seven weeks working on the script. Really? Which he referred to as seven weeks of hell. I uh, don't blame him. Because it was essentially take whatever Kevin says and put it in the script. My point is, you're right. I'm agreeing with you, Steve. This script, it's like, if you think about it for more than two seconds, I mean, if you just think about the fact that they put Enola on a basket and floated her away from the beautiful land with fresh water and vegetation. There has to be some story there as to why that happened, but we're never told what it is, so it might as well not exist. Can we just take a moment to enjoy when they finally get to dry land and they find huts, essentially, like houses, and they walk in to this one, and what do they? What do the grown-ups see? Two skeletons who clearly laid down and died next to each other holding hands, and they're like, oh, dear God. And then Enola walks in, sees the music box, and goes, I'm home! And what I wrote was, uh, don't, 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 don't have her look over here. Don't, don't have her look over to the bed. Yeah, look at the music box, Enola. <laughs> hey, why don't we go outside? You can play it for us. No, no, don't look over there. Don't look over there. It's okay. It's fine. Everything's fine. Going back to the idea of the scenes just not being tied together well yeah. at all, I appreciated the fact that I think the song that the music box plays is the song that she was humming yes. earlier in yes. the movie. I liked that touch. But that is about the only thing I liked about it. That that it's... is Steve Silver lining on this hundred and seventy five million dollar film. Oh, end of the film. I have to laugh. They get the girl out. They get the girl out, but then she falls into the water, and the mariner grabs a rope and says, "Tie that, tie that," and then. Swan dives into the water as three jet skis are coming to grab her at the same time. And he grabs her and is flung right back up into the sky. The three jet skis run into each other, exploding. And what are you going to say? My note for this scene is as follows. Bungee jumping. This movie is so stupid. <laughs> Hilariously, my note just says, bungee cord? That just looked like a rope. But it very much is a, it, all it was missing was the sound effect. Boing. Boing. <laughs> and I was like, really? Bungee jumping is what you came up with as the solution? Anytime that I find something horrendously wrong, I try to stop and think, okay, would I have done something differently? What could have been done different? And <laughs> that particular scene would have been so easy to fix. Because, as you say, it looks like rope. So yeah. have him tie the rope to his feet, jump in, grab the girl, and then have the balloon, like, they cut a sandbag, and so the balloon suddenly lifts them out of the water just in time for the jet skis to hit each other. Fine. Bungee jumping? Let's go back to the very beginning of this film. At the start of this film, in case you have the joy of never having watched it, what we see is close-ups of the mariner walking on his boat, and then he starts peeing in a cup. 
And then he puts the cup through a machine, and then it turns it into a cup of fresh, delicious water, and then he chugs it. And the entire audience goes, ah! Yeah. <laughs> and I remember writing, why was this your opener? Like, you're establishing this epic, right? Think of any epic, right? And start it with something like that. That's not how you start Braveheart. Making it worse is the shot that leads up to this because it is the, again, the, 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 the globe being covered in water and then we zoom in on this ocean. It is a vast ocean. We see the trimaran in the distance and then we pull up to it and then he's peeing in a cup. That's how we are introduced to man who drinks his urine. Can we talk about the very end for just one moment? So they get to the island and the... What was it the five people that are going to stay are going to stay, but dry land is no place for a mariner. And so he takes one of the old wooden catamarans that has been drug up and left on the shore by the previous inhabitants, and he gathers supplies, pushes it out into the surf, and starts to sail away from the island, and Helen and Enola run to the top of a hill so that they can look at him sailing away, and in my mind all I heard was, I am Moana! <laughs> Me too. Like, me too. And that's it. And then the movie just stops and credits begin. It's like that 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 was it. Four people found dry land where everyone is dead. Dude with gills is like, I'm out. <laughs> and he leaves. And the four people, I guess, will discover why everyone who's left is skeletons. So as we may have hinted, people did not like this film. It got a lot of pre-reviews that were like, this is no good. When they actually reviewed the film, it was mixed. It was actually mixed. Some people kind of liked it. Of course, it was immediately compared to Mad Max. A lot of people thought, great sets, great action, but only marginally good. A lot of people referred to it as kind of a B-movie. Some reviews were much worse. But not all. It actually received an Academy nomination. I'm assuming for something to do with visual effects, because those were fantastic. It was actually for sound. It did receive a BAFTA nomination for special visual effects, Saturn Award nomination for best costumes. I will say the costumes are actually pretty decent. And it got four Golden Raspberry Awards. The Raspberry Awards are the, the anti-Oscars. They're the awards people want to give you for bad movies and bad performances. It was nominated for Worst Picture, Worst Director, Worst Actor, Worst Best Supporting Actor for Dennis Hopper, which he won. Oh, so, yes. That makes me sad because I thought Dennis Hopper was one of the highlights of this film. I am glad you thought so. I do not share your sentiment. No, let me rephrase. I think he gave a great performance based on what the script said. I just think I didn't like what the script said. So, <laughs> okay. the, ergo, I did not like Dennis Hopper, but I don't think that's his fault. As we said, they spent up to $175 million. At the box office, they made 264. They were actually number one for the first two weeks. It was actually the ninth top grossing film of 1995. When your budget is that high, that really doesn't mean an awful lot. It took the studio years to regain the losses. And they did that through home video, TV rights, video game rights, novelization, four-issue comic book series. P.S. Costner refused to allow his likeness to be used. Universal Studios Hollywood Japan and Singapore had a live Waterworld show. Which I remember seeing, and that bit was kind of fun. Here's, I think, the rub. Do you know what happens two years later? Tell me the postman comes out. No. Titanic. Oh. Yes, they listened to Steven Spielberg and shot in a tank. They spend $200 million, but unlike Waterworld, they make... $2.2 billion. <laughs> they get 14 Oscar nominations. They win 11 of those Oscars, including Best Picture and Best Director. So everything I think he wanted Waterworld to be, Titanic becomes. And it's one of those where you bet on the wrong pony. <laughs> and like This is the one. This is the one. Because even when the studio came to Hawaii and they, they went to see it, they're like, no, 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 this is still good. We still believe in this. They're like, this is still a cash cow. This is going to make us a billion dollars. What a mess. What a mess. This was, I think, the third miss for Costner. Suddenly they realize he's not a golden goose. He continues to do work. Nothing against him. And of course, he's just had his cowboy renaissance here recently with Yellowstone. So, you know, he's still doing it. But yeah, Waterworld. Waterworld, Waterworld. I was actually hoping that it was better than I remembered. Same here. 
I was mistaken. I wanted to like it, but I just couldn't. You know, you see movies when you're that young, 15, 16 years old, and you don't get it. I was actually thinking about Remains of the Day the other day. And I thought to myself, you know, if I watch Remains of the Day now, like a whole other layer of thought would go through my brain than, than back then. So I thought maybe this would be one of those movies. If I see it now, I'll be like, oh, I see what they were trying to do. Oh, this is much deeper than I thought. Nope. If anything, it just made it so much worse for me. Yeah. That's Waterworld. You can watch it or not, is my personal opinion on that. It's available. At the time of this, I think it was on Amazon Prime for free. It was. So there you go. And you should only watch it if it's free. If you're interested in Waterworld, go to YouTube and find one of these channels that does like the, oh, the 10 best scenes out of movies sure. and just post them as clips and just watch the highlight clips. Because again, individual scenes, very well put together, very pretty to look at. The cinematography is great. It's only when you try to stick the pieces together that you realize it's kind of a Frankenstein that just does not work. That's it, folks. That is our recap, review, stumble into Waterworld. Steve. Sir. Do you have a film picked out for us to do next? I had narrowed it down to about three or four, and then I watched the movie. And then I got so pissed off <laughs> that I decided, okay, if we're going to go to a dark future for the world, I want to see a future for the world that is better. We've got to go back to 1976 so that we can leap forward to the year 2274 and visit the blissful utopia that is the setting for Logan's Run. Well, that's it. This is the end of Waterworld and the beginning of Logan's Run. Thank you so much for listening. Please leave a review or a star or a like or whatever. It helps to get more people to listen to us ramble on about these films. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. And if I may quote William Preston, now that we are done with Waterworld, Oh, thank God. Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie? 